On today's show, there was some breaking news, and we break down all sides of the Stephon Diggs trade, and then we jump into some of these incoming rookie wide receivers, and then a rookie tight end. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a moment. Enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Uh, welcome in. Another extraordinary episode of the Fantasy Footballers coming your way. Surprised by some NFL news we get to talk about. Big news. Big, big surprise news. We were all reacting to it immediately. Now we've had a little bit of time to, I don't know, just sit with it for a second. To digest, to, Ooh. to let the system work, and then see what comes out. You normally fall asleep while you digest. While I metabolize, that's that's yeah, correct. Is that what you do with your news? Yeah, no. Like I, you let it all, like, you let it digest, and then you pass it, and, and then, then I you pass it, and I <laughs> and I and I look through it, and I say, "What did we?" Eat? You get the we, important stuff, right? When we were younger men, gross, and we were doing this, <laughs> we were doing this show from an upstairs bedroom back uh, almost ten years ago. It was it was tradition to have the three of us. We'd take a lunch break. It'd go oh, out, go out yes. in the car, yeah, and and we may or may not have frequented some, uh, I don't know, fatty joints, <laughs> yeah, some delicious, some joints. delicious yes. food. But it was a it was a regular occurrence to be like driving back to the studio. And Mike and I would be in the front seats, and I'd be in the bed, and you would be in the <laughs> in the back. No, oftentimes no, no. In, in the, the bed, in the middle seat, and you would be, you'd be asleep. Yeah. Yeah, my body shuts down after I eat. So, um, but you've you're pro you've metabolized this news. Yeah, the 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 big news, which I don't know if we're talking about it now yet, yeah, feels like we're not in the news section. Um, the digs news. Yeah, the well, big digs news. Yes. So uh, no, we'll talk about it in just a second. But uh, I'm sure we all have opinions. It was very much the type of move digs going from the Bills to the Texans with tons of fantasy football ramifications, not just for this year, but for years to come. And we'll talk about all of them. Looking forward to it, uh, including our updated rankings in the ultimate draft kit, the Dynasty Pass, our view of players like Tank Dell long-term, Stephon Diggs, Nico Collins, C.J. Stroud, C Curtis Samuel, Dalton Kincaid, uh, Josh Allen, etc., all impacted by the move. And those are available at ultimatedraftkit.com. We are three weeks from the NFL draft. We Which just got more exciting. More draftier. It, 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 it really did. Now the, I think the assumed first round wide receiver draft pick by the Bills is going to matter so much more. If they stay where they are at the back of the first, that means that there is a new wide receiver name that's going to potentially leapfrog to being the fourth draft pick after the big three wide receivers. So, um, you know, when when we're really breaking down that news, we'll talk about it, but it just makes this coming draft more exciting. It's going to be fun just three weeks away. There's a new Dynasty podcast available. came out yesterday, so you can check that out. Apparently the Champ 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 edition of the show. Yeah, it was good. And, uh, oh, yeah, because you guys are both on it with Matthew Betts. That mm -hmm. is correct. As Kyle skipped out on work this week. Uh, X at the FF Ballers if you want to follow the show. You can watch it on YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Subscribe, click the bell. Trust me, you want to do that. We've got. Yes, you, you do. I'll just say you want to do that. And I would say you want to do that in the next 24 hours. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> News and notes from around the league. Would, me and Andy can be like the teaser mm -hmm. trailer mm -hmm. and you're like, and we try and do teasers and then Jason's just like, no, here's the whole trailer right after. They still don't know, man. 
but they know they know they that there's yeah, imminence. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah, the movie yeah. trailer that gives away too much. Yeah, I'm the movie You're trailer like, that tease me that gets the people in the seats. You tantalize, and then when they watch mine, they You're- go, "All right, I bought my tickets." <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, here was the blockbuster trade: the Bills trading Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans. Woo-hoo. The Bills receive a 2025 second round pick, so not this year, and the Texans get Diggs a 25 fifth and a sixth rounder this year in the bills. They will carry $31.1 million in dead money for digs. Uh, and goodbye. Like the, the time has come digs disgruntedly leaves another franchise. And I think, I mean, we could probably talk about this for the whole show if we, we want, if there, we wanted to. So there's I, an, enough information here to, to dig through. I mean, you could talk about the non fantasy implications first of just the actual bills wanted to get rid of Stefan Diggs and this contract they're eating a ton of money and they're not getting that much compensation they're getting less than a second round future pick um this year they're giving up a sixth and getting nothing back other than paying a large chunk of his salary so clearly whether this was Diggs trying to get out the bills wanting to get out this is a we no longer want Stefan Diggs as part of our plan to be the best team we can be. It, it, it's like getting out while the car still runs a little bit, right? And you can sell it. But if you wait a year and the car can't run at all, it's even worse of a situation. I I want to give a shout out to Scott Barrett, great friend of the show. You know, he, he broke down the pre and post Joe Brady numbers. Diggs was at 86.8 yards per game, the wide receiver nine before the transition an offensive coordinator last year. He dropped to 45 yards per game after that, which was the wide receiver 58. Uh, according to Scott Barrett, uh, Scott Barrett, he had asked an NFL insider about Joe Brady, the comments he was given, not well respected around the league because he doesn't know how to scheme guys open. The numbers were cut in half for digs. That would be either a concession by the Bills part that Diggs' is, importance on the team is no longer there, Right, like, because maybe they they obviously brought back Joe Brady and they liked what the offense was doing with him. And right? they they won a lot of games. And I they mean, won a lot of games. Yeah. So, so you're happy with your offense, but at the same time, you can analyze it and say, well, we we needed 45 yards from this receiver, at, to to succeed, and so maybe we can yeah, get that. Yeah, you can moneyball that. Yeah, maybe you can get that with a a discount somewhere, right? Like maybe um, Khalil Shahir, Sh- Sh- uh, Shakir, Shakir, <laughs> Shakira. Yeah, those hips don't lie. Uh can get it done for us. So there's that side of it. And that could be an encouraging side for Houston because maybe it was scheme and maybe Diggs has a year or two left of elite performance. And you go to Houston with CJ Stroud and Nico Collins and Tank Dell and Dalton Schultz and Joe Mixon. And they upgraded their defense a lot this offseason as well. So you've got to be ecstatic if you are a Texans fan right now and feeling like your team is actually capable of a of a Super Bowl run. That that that's awesome. For Diggs, let's start with the fantasy value of him. I believe my biggest fear with Diggs, like he was very low. He was on my personal early rankings prior to this news. He was my wide receiver twenty two. This is a guy, barely a wide receiver two because the Joe Brady system that he brought over didn't utilize him. Didn't use him down the field the same as he was in the first half. Like we just talked about. After the bye week, the last five games where they ran the table and won all the games, he was fewer than five catches a game, 42 yards. It was like they, he was unused, so I didn't want him. I don't – like, there is the chance that he's starting to age out. He's going to play this year at 31. Maybe he's lost a step, and it's – you know, they're getting out before, like you said, before the car breaks down. That That could exist, but I actually – was more afraid of Joe Brady for Diggs than that than seeing like when I watched I didn't feel like Diggs looked terrible so moving over to CJ Stroud getting down the field getting in this you know this open uh system that you know was up there in the league lead of of passing yardage I think oh, he was is, he was number 1 yeah I was very so up there so that's that's way up there like all you looking straight up you're like yeah. my neck, all the way up there my neck hurts to look at that cuz it's at the top like a per game um Stroud, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I thought did Stroud get hurt? I yeah, Stroud missed that. some games, so I'm sure it was might have been per game. But um, 
so I think this is great news for for Diggs. This gives him new life that I did not want to have. Yeah, he Stratton comes in teams. and at least in camp at the beginning of the season, you presume that Stephon Diggs is going to be the number one of these three good options in the offense. That's my presumption is that he will be given the chance to be the primary weapon in the C.J. Stroud high-flying offense. Okay, so that that would be – that's one angle. If you want to take another angle, it can be – look, Houston's giving it a shot. They didn't have to invest a lot to do it. And uh, it's uh, year 31, year 30, year 31, DeAndre Hopkins situation. You know, Hopkins in year 30, one of the best in the entire league, 64 for 7, 17, and 3. Last year, 75 for 1,007. That's not a – that's a I made an impact number. That's not a I – one year your fantasy league number whether Diggs is entering that stage of his career or not I think it's going to call into question the value of Tank Dell at least in the one year window Nico Collins in the one year window going into a free agency period for him um I know it's really really good for CJ Stroud yes and it's, it's helpful and CJ Stroud was I mean just to be clear like last year he was a top 10 per game fantasy quarterback and this year you bring in Joe Mixon who can catch the football who can uh, solidify your running game, and you bring in Stephon Diggs, and you bring back Dalton Schultz, and like Tank Dell missed time, so like C.J. Stroud could make a leap. This could be a player that ends up top six, seven. It's it's possible he would. It's he still has the curse of the pocket passer of you got to be in the high thirties, bare minimum. You got to be in the high thirties of passing touchdowns if you're going to make that jump to being a true difference maker maybe Stefan Diggs can do that the I'm I'm more stuck on the side of a team in a championship win now window traded their presumed number one wide receiver ate an unbelievable amount of dead cap got very little in the return we you know we were taking Jay and I were taking a look back at like what what Devontae Adams got? What Tyreek Hill got in the Halls, trade compensation? What Chase Halls. Claypool got? <laughs> Claypool <laughs> was traded for Some more. Some mistakes may have been made in that trade, Andy, in the Chase Claypool one. Verdict is not in yet. <laughs> but I think some <laughs> I think some mistakes might have been made. Um, but point being, a team that's trying to win right now said, we got to get you out of here. And another wrinkle that I just – uh, was thinking of I'm like, well, what's what's Stephon Diggs' contract really look like after this? And assuming I'm reading this right from over the cap, Diggs has no more guaranteed money after this year, and would turn into a dead money of zero dollars. That that Next. is so they just had to write it out for one more year, and didn't do it. They could it, it, again. Assuming I'm reading every it, uh, that's, contracts are complicated. That's what I see on Spot Track as well. So. It's like that's a whole other piece of this. They're like, you got to get off this team. So it's, he is a he can burn your team down. That's he that's did what it. I'm in, saying. He did it in Minnesota, and they didn't want to go through it this year. But and and to your point, they even got rid of him in the, in the conference to a contender. Like you don't yes. generally see in conference to contender situations like that. So it, the they don't believe there there is so much on the Bills side of. We got to get out of this. We cannot take it anymore. And and honeymoon situation, it's Stephon Diggs going into a high-powered offense, so maybe you get good, positive Stephon Diggs who's helping things out. But at this point of his career, I don't know him personally, but there's just so much noise through the media, through his, so, through his personal social media where you go, this guy makes it about himself a lot. Both Diggs brothers now in Texas. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, there are also implications for Josh Allen. I think everybody would like to understand that for the long term. Not having somebody that is, you know, Gabe Davis is gone, went to Jacksonville. Um, Stephon Diggs, goodbye. Right now the depth chart is Curtis Samuel, oh. free agent pickup, Khalil Shakir, Matt Collins, uh, uh, KJ Hamler, Andy there. Isabella. Dalton Kincaid. Yeah, Dalton Kincaid gets the huge bump. They are – it would be shocking if they don't take a first round wide receiver, possibly even trading up for a wide receiver. Or trading for or yeah, or T. You'll, Higgins, you go after Brandon Ayuk. T sure. I, that, I do think you take a breath in the analyzing of that Bills wide receiver room until we have it 
more the, figured I, out. I would agree. On on the Bills wide receiver room, you don't want to make giant decisions and say, well, Curtis Samuel's their one. Go tr you know, trade for him. He's going to be special. I, I definitely moved him up in dynasty rankings once he signed there, and it, it, the prospects look good, reunited with Joe Brady. But uh, I would agree with you. you. You take a breath there. On the other side, you've got to kind of decide – now that it is solidified for the Texans, what do you think about Tank Dell, Nico Collins, both from a redraft and a dynasty perspective? We were talking on the Dynasty show yesterday about no, – I, I actually, Jay, I deleted it. <laughs> well, well, Betts and I were talking about the part where Collins is a little bit scary, um, even though he was so good and he's young and it looks like he, you know, he's part of this future, he's on the last year of a deal. And they tried to go get Keenan Allen. Now right. they did get Stephon Diggs. So unless he gets that new deal, from a dynasty perspective, I moved Nico Collins down um, quite fair. a bit. He's, he's still young. He'll get another contract with a different team if he doesn't get re-signed by the Texans. But obviously, the one time we've seen fantasy relevance was with C.J. Stroud in this offense. So th he takes a hit. Dell, to me, Tank Dell didn't move that much to me. Me neither. Both in redraft and in um, dynasty, I, I think he is. No, he made me. A, he he made him a target for me. Yeah, because dynasty, now you because, can buy him lower. Yeah, and the 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 final thing I'll add, and Jay, you alluded to it of just the adding some excitement to rookie drafts, where it, it uh, for me the the way the first round was starting to shape up for your rookie drafts was, you know, those non super flex, those first three wide receivers, and then kind of a tier two, but it's like. They're going to be first rounders, but I don't know if they're all really exciting. This, the the combination of the Buffalo Bills now being a a go to situation, the chance that the Kansas City Chiefs do one, and now uh, the with the Dallas Cowboys have done visits with essentially all the big name running backs. It's like, man, if we get a running back to Dallas in the second round, or even even the third, and now with this move with the Buffalo Bills. Your later round first have appreciated in value. Yeah, they're 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 getting better, and this is the perfect show to talk through this news on because we're going to be going right. through all these top wide receiver names. I think most of the casual listeners they're familiar with the big three names now. I was going to say that that's Mike ass assume that everyone's heard that, but maybe not. I yeah, mean, Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, superstar Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze. Those are kind of locked in as the the top three. Yeah, and then we're going to go through you know four through I don't know how many we're getting through on today's episode but these are the names where they're they're potential first rounders one of these guys is probably going to end up on the Buffalo Bills and that guy's probably going to be the fourth pick in your in your rookie drafts unless they trade all the way up yeah, for one of the big I, three I think the draft's going to be have some surprises I mean in a world where T Higgins is traded someplace even if his destination isn't good Suddenly, Cincinnati's an interesting place for a, yeah, right, a rookie right wide receiver yep. to to land, or San Francisco. Oh, and, you man, know, this is gonna be a fun month. Uh, so that's three weeks away, but yeah, it is. It has timed up well. Today is the uh, second part of a rookie preview show. We did the running backs and quarterbacks on the Tuesday episode of the podcast. Today we are covering the wide receivers and a tight end. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so, uh, before we close out the news, I want to give you whatever the maximum opposite excitement level news is how, possible how dare you so if the Diggs news was really exciting to you i want to give you the last piece of news we have for the day which is the chiefs have re-signed clyde edwards alaire to a one-year deal yeah this is right after meeting with jk dobbins so i don't yeah. know if that's the best news for dobbins my, my big takeaways here are the uh, pacheco is even safer <laughs> that's true um, and jk dobbins the 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 recovery can't be going as well as you would hope. They just signed Clyde well, Edwards Well, you know, yeah. it can be going well, and yet the team might not think you're worth that money. You know, if you if you come from a place like Dobbins did of like I think I'm a top running back, and then teams that, that's possible. Teams I don't, don't know. see because that that happens a lot. Teams don't see you at the value you see yourself. So who knows if you know Clyde's like, oh gosh, give me anything. I'd love to come back. Yeah, I mean he look, he's going for a third Super Bowl. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> who was it? Adam Morrison? Is that the guy that won the oh, Super, on the Lakers? The Lakers uh, <laughs> NBA Finals performances. Um, who made a bigger contribution, Melvin Gordon or Clyde edwards alaire today? <laughs> no, that's totally disrespectful. Um, all right, quick break, and we'll jump into the rookies. <laughs> the 
one thing before we jump into the rookies, I, I do want to ask one more question, which is just, and it kind of didn't come up, so maybe that tells me something about your opinions, but Josh Allen, like, it's nice to have a premier number one, and I know it didn't go that direction over the second half of the year, and I'm guessing right now, I'm watching Jason type into his computer, and I'm almost positive he's going to give me game logs of Josh Allen without Stephon Diggs' premier performances and then tell me why he's not worried. That's exactly right. You are 100% correct. <laughs> Here is from week 11 on the fantasy finish for Josh Allen while Stephon Diggs was worthless and irrelevant. I think he had one game. Uh, so you have, uh, he was the quarterback five, the quarterback one, the quarterback nine, bad game, quarterback 17, quarterback two, quarterback six, quarterback four. So he's, he was a top finisher. He's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah you're not worried about. So no panic dynasty trades of, uh, no. Josh Allen. No, they're going to do something. Yeah. I, I, I'm not too worried. He's still going to run the ball. He's still going to have so many rushing touchdowns and uh, maybe even more now. Okay. Into the rookies we go. Hey, rookie. Welcome to the NFL. All right, as we said on Tuesday, if you are just thirsty, right, like you want to metabolize and digest even more information about this year's rookie class, please, after today's preview show, avail yourself of the Dynasty podcast. There are uh, deep dives on all of these players, and the Dynasty Pass at ultimatedraftkit.com has production profiles rookie mock drafts, risers and fallers, and our ever-evolving rookie and dynasty rankings. Starting with wide receivers today, if we're honest, this is the most exciting group to talk about of all the positions, and so it's going to get the majority, if not all, of today's time. There are a lot of teams out there that have desperate needs at wide receiver, teams like Arizona who shipped off Hollywood Brown and Rondale Moore and have really not even somebody that classifies as a wide receiver two on the roster for Kyler Murray. Um, you've got New England in desperate need. The Chargers don't have anybody left. The Giants, they seem to be uh, projected by many to take, you know, a Malik Neighbors in the first seven picks. Denver needs a wide out, New Orleans, and several other teams. I mean, we're talking about the Bills now, right? The Bills are on that list. Yeah. And, um, you know, you want to see prolific – Quarterbacks connected to some of these targets. Marvin Harrison sits atop the list of uh, prospects at wide receiver. One of the bullet points that Kyle wanted to put in the show doc today was created in a laboratory. I don't know if that's yeah. actually been vetted, but 6'3", Have you seen him? Lightning speed. Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, laboratory. I would like him on the Arizona <laughs> Cardinals very, very badly. <laughs> um, two consecutive years of 14 touchdowns, 1,200-plus yards, um, you know. And just being the the dude for uh, for Ohio State, you know, getting doubled frequently. They're just Marvin Harrison is truly a stud, and he is a stud. At, like, he is a prototypical outside wide receiver who can do basically everything on the field. Great hands, great routes. He there there will he will go in the top five picks of the NFL draft, maybe at three, but anywhere from three to five, like it's it's happening. It's locked in. And you should feel very confident. You should feel Jamar Chase levels of confidence drafting him as the one oh one in your rookie draft surf or, or as the first positional player if you're in a super flex. Yeah, so you know, he's one of the three guys that Jason mentioned earlier in the show that are, uh, I think all of them, if they were in their own draft class without the others, you know, they classify as being worthy of a top five pick and the best wide receiver in that group. It is a top, top, top heavy group of three superstars, um, all in that same Jamar Chase coming out of college conversation. Right. You're you're talking about people that are prolific across the board. Physically, they're production their age their all the all the things that set superstars apart these three guys pretty much have it but to me Marvin Harrison Jr. is in his own tier he's taller his route running is great his hands are great he has very so he has polished. almost zero yellow flags I just I don't even know what the hole in his game is. And Do you see the weakness that Kyle put down for us? I did not see it. Let me see. Weakness. Perhaps. We have too high of hopes 
Um, that, that's fair because, honestly, if he becomes a really solid NFL wide receiver, will 100% be a disappointment. Yeah, if this dude's like you, wide receiver 15. Yeah, you're, you're not you, – that's not what the expectation is for Marvin Harrison Jr. The expectation for him is that he's going to follow his father into the Hall of Fame. This is a Hall of Famer's son who's just taller and a, a better athlete than him. Um, being the son of an NFL Hall of Famer does not or, – or any sport does not mean that you are great. It doesn't. Um, there's plenty of athletes, children who, you know, aren't that good. Uh, Frank Gore Jr. is in this class. He's not being talked about as the number one running back, but it is to me still a bonus when you are the best in college, when you are dominant and you have the pedigree and the life coaching and everything from a hall of fame dad, that's a cherry on top. Christian McCaffrey is the son of Ed McCaffrey. You know, it's like, when you come out and you are supposed to be unbelievable and you have the the pedigree and the heritage, it matters to me. Well, and, and he is such a like kind of soft spoken, uh, consistent, polished wide receiver. He's going to dominate uh, unquestionably outside of injury. I think he's a he's a lock, and that's what you're looking for if you're going to draft a wide receiver in the top five or six picks. You need to know that they're going to be your guy for a very long time. In this draft, you have three guys that could fit that mold, certainly two. Malik Neighbors out of LSU comes in uh, as the second name we're going to discuss. He's six foot, Harrison six three. Uh he's a little bit lighter. He ran a four three five. He has been uh just a dominator at LSU, lines up all over the field, fits the NFL perfectly. And uh, you know, I know it's it's like you know, I don't know how much of it is just to be hot takey or just to have something different to say. Some people like him more than Marvin Harrison or think his game will translate better. Um, I don't think that, but I think he is going to be a an extremely valuable fantasy pick for a very, very long time. To me, neighbors, the, the neighbors versus uh, Marvin comes down to just what like, – how do you look at the offense, the future of offense in the NFL? Because Malik Neighbors – was in the slot over half of his snaps last year. Now that – and generally, you like a slot wide receiver, it's easier to replace, and it's not – it's not normally the player that you run your offense through. Now things have changed, and we know that more and more players are are starting to dom be called slot players, but they're dominating in the NFL. So that, that – that's where it's the the difference can come to me. Where if you prefer that, then you're you would probably want Malik Neighbors. If you want the 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 larger guy on the outside, then you want Harrison. Deep down the field, slot production um, in college doesn't always translate. We've seen that over and over and over. But Malik Neighbors has intangibles and other things on film that just say, yeah, he's absolutely that dude. His explosiveness is crazy, and the comp for me is, and I I I don't know if it's just an it's just like, kind of feels stupid to say it, but the comp is Jamar Chase, and I don't know if it's just because it's LSU, you know, you're what, but he reminds me so well, much. I, he's compact, he's so explosive. I mean, you got he's six foot two hundred, ran a pro day four three five, with a thirty nine inch vertical. That's I mean, Jamar Chase is six foot two hundred one, ran a four three nine with a forty one inch vertical. Like they're they're very similar archetypes. You know, where it's you can you can uh you know get him on a screen or you can get him downfield either way. What's funny is I thought you were going to talk about a different LSU product. Yeah, Jefferson, which was Justin Jefferson because he was Jefferson ran 575 of his 583 routes in the slot, and that was the critique coming in. Yeah, as a first year guy, but you know that translated okay. Yeah, I mean either one, either one, take your pick. But I do think LSU with, can really churn out some wide receivers yeah terrace marshall uh, uh, <laughs> well, well come on man well we got another one in this draft right we do brian thomas we'll talk and about he'll him be later. the probably the fourth wide receiver drafted and did you have something you wanted to add on neighbors mike no it just that it's the, the if you're going to put a knock on him it's that he was in the slot but it's it's very difficult to not point immediately to justin jefferson yeah and Who, say that, i remember those conversations yep What's crazy to me, too, is like I think if you're in a dynasty league and you're like, darn, I don't get Jefferson. Like This is the year to be really happy, I think, mm -hmm. with the next couple of guys where, yes, they are technically competing, but at the same time, you can look at it like, wow, I got a 
top 10 wide receiver at the four or the five in my dynasty draft? Well, I'm very fortunate this year because that didn't exist in previous seasons. So uh, Roma Dunze out of Washington is the third name of those big three. He, he, okay, yeah, I was. this is the number I wanted to grab, by the way, just circling back real quick. I asked the guys for the slot rate for CeeDee Lamb. When you think about the kind of player that Malik Neighbors can be, CeeDee Lamb was a 51.3% slot rate guy this year. So um, teams are being more creative yeah. in moving people around to be able to get them the ball. Uh, Roma Dunze, 6'3", 215. He's a big boy. Uh, absolutely dominated last year, 1,640 yards, 13 touchdowns as a senior in Washington, um, a junior, sorry. And tons of big plays off the arm of Michael Penix Jr., who can really throw it. Uh, when I watched the film on Adunze, it was body control. It was um, circus catches. It was just body awareness. What do you guys think his situation will be? And do you view him, you know, you said you have Harrison in a different tier, but so, is Adunze with neighbors to you? No, he is not. Um, it, 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 it feels a little um, easy, but it's but it's true. For me, I've, I, I've got Harrison in his own tier, Malik Neighbors in his own tier, and then Adunze in his own tier. Like, uh, And then the next, like, 12 guys are all together. Um, Adunze is my number three, but he has – a few more red flags in the sense that, you know, we when you look at man versus zone and, you know, when you've got a guy who's so good at contested catches, which Adunze is, you love to see the trait. You want to know that when you throw the ball up to him, he's going to grab it. But you also want that. You don't want him to always have to be making contested catches um, because you want that separation. And I, I saw plenty of times where Odunze separated. He's not a guy with a, a backpack on him like some college uh, players are where there's yeah, just a defender. His contested target percentage last year was 16 and a half of which he caught nearly 48% of them, which is a tremendous differential. He is a wonderful athlete who is the size of a prototypical guy who can have 150 targets over the course of an NFL season. You love to see that his draft capital is going to be high. Uh, he's going to go to, you know, he's usually mocked to the bears at nine. Uh, I don't know if that is so chalk that it can't happen now. Uh, but, you know, he is a very, very good wide receiver. There are a few flags in his game that I that I don't see in Neighbors and Harrison. All right. Anything to add, Mike, or do you want to move on? No, I mean, if you want the numbers. So he was better. His yards per route run in man was uh, about .8 yards better than in zone, which is – Kind of what Jason was highlighting of, you know, we, we you, the the league, the NFL defenses are moving more and more to zone, which maybe then you get you know, a bounce back. Yeah, eventually, pendulum eventually, swing. Yeah, eventually we'll direction. get the pendulum swing back, but it, it, that's not so large of a gap that I'm concerned about it. Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU is the next wide receiver we'll talk about. He's fourth in our rookie ranks. He was a touchdown machine at LSU. He's 6'4", 201, 17 touchdowns last year, over 1,100 yards. Uh, pretty impressive on film. Uh, I do see Mike giving him a nickname, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is Basket Catch Brian. Well, just, so talk about that. I, it was just, I mean, for a guy who's, I mean, over 17 yards a catch, 17 receiving touchdowns, it just felt like, I didn't see him high pointing the ball as much too many, as too many basket yeah, catches. Yeah, too too many try and catch it in the gut for me. Uh not that, that it makes him a uh I'm not, you know, not completely knocking him for that. The he's a very interesting player of the size is there, the final season production is there, but that's what he has. So it's two years of being a three hundred and fifty yard wide receiver. One year of being an 1,100 yard, 17 touchdown guy, making his breakout age being almost 21. That's a little bit higher than we want to see. So those, but his current age is also 21, and that right. is what we want to see. Yes. So it's there. He's a, he he's a, we're, we're nitpicking here, but he's he's not in the same tier as the other guys. No, no, no. He's certainly not. When I, when I watched him the first time, I had concerns. Um, I saw the same thing you saw with basket catches that were not needing to be made that way. 
Now he is a late transfer. He's no, he's no Xavier Leggett, my right, Jay? <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he's um a late bloomer at wide receiver. He changed to wide receiver later in his athletic career. Doesn't have as much experience, so the way he catches the ball is a little concerning. Um, I also had concerns of like, well, how much has he benefiting from Malik Neighbors? Uh, you know, on the other okay, side of the yeah. field, you, you you don't have the defenses focused on Brian Thomas, but he is an exceptional athlete. Of you know, one of those really better than you athletes ran sub four four at you know six four two hundred, and when I went back and watched Jaden Daniels. I was a little bit more impressed with Brian Thomas. When I was watching, instead of trying to focus on him and kind of watch the, the offense go when the, you know, when the downs were needed, he was there a lot. He, 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 it's really surprising to me the games where he kind of was extremely important and or took over for a stretch considering his targets per route run is the biggest red flag yes. in his entire – I mean, his targets per route run, 19.3%. There are only four first-round wide receivers since 2015 below 22%, and he's at 19, and you don't want those names. Yes, they do. Those names are Kadarius Toney, yeah. Jalen Rager, Gross. Henry Ruggs, mm. and Philip Dorsett, uh -oh. and they've all kind of got a type. They're real, real fast guys, and that is his type. So I have, I have concerns with Brian Thomas. At first, through the scouting process, he wasn't even my wide receiver four. When I went back through, I do think because of where he's going to be drafted, his athleticism, his young age and newness to the position, I I, I think his um his ceiling is is good. But I do worry, like, what if he just becomes and and for fantasy purposes, he just becomes a, a downfield two? stretch big play guy where it's like, you know, those guys aren't That's, that great for fantasy. It's funny because that is exactly how I feel about the player we're going to talk about next oh, after, shame after, on you. after the break. So we just got done talking about 6'4", 201, Brian Thomas. Very slender. Not as slender as this guy, Troy Franklin, 6'2", 176. 183. 183. Okay. So you can tell these two guys have him ranked Higher than I. No. This is the first time we have a departure, by the way, in our rookie rankings of these guys. Troy Franklin weighed in at 176. Hey, Franklin. What this? Hey, Franklin. Wow, you oh, have that drop. Nice. He weighed in at 176 at the combine. Uh, later in his pro day, he weighed in at 183, and it came out that he had he was sick before mm. uh, the combine, so he had lost a bunch of weight and gained it back. Sorry. Yeah, he performed at the but, combine like a sick guy. He did. He he had a it really wasn't really bad his best day showing. at the combine. Weighed in under what we wanted to see. Ran slower than we wanted to see. He wasn't slow, but you expected him to be sub four four. Yeah, his film. He looks like a rocket ship. His film is blazing. This is one of my favorite prospects in this year's draft. I love how open he gets at all levels of the field. Now you're talking about you see him working primarily deep down the well, field. I, yeah, I think physically he's not built to be one of those top-tier guys that we talked about earlier. I think, uh, you know, some of the comps uh, size-wise is like, you know, Robbie slash Chosen Anderson, Tyquan Thornton, body size. I saw the best of him to me at Oregon. The best of him was over the top, down the field, stretch the defense, scorch him in the secondary. But to me, that, it, that doesn't necessarily translate into – um, you know, and, and coming from Oregon, that doesn't necessarily translate into a consistent, you know, wide receiver one caliber type of player. Destination is going to play a huge role. And I should say that now, like reiterate it now, because we did on the last show, but like we're talking about our prospects based on what we're watching. The destination for these guys is going to make a tremendous difference. You know, if, if they come into a situation, we believe they'll be utilized correctly, higher volume. Troy Franklin concerns me. Uh, sometimes you see him projected in the first, late, late, late first. More often than not, he's not there. So you're talking about a second or third round wide receiver. You know, does d big difference between landing in Kansas City or Carolina. Sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, destination's going to make a big deal here. But w w on the tape, what I saw, what I enjoyed, he his his routes to me were were very good. The way that he uses them to combined with his speed like he has not everybody has a you know a trump card where it's like 
I, I just, you, you can't keep up with me. Troy Franklin on film can glide across the field in a few gazelle swoops, and he's just gone. You're not catching him. And whether that's on a slant, whether that's on a screen behind the line of scrimmage, or whether that's on a bomb down the field, I've seen him do it all. Uh, he, he struggled with a few drops this year, but that was not how he was you know, the year prior. I love his mentality, too, when you watch him play. You know, he's got that dog in him. I love that for a wide receiver. Uh, he was one of the most fun prospects for me to watch on a play-in, play-out basis. How, I am curious, though. Like, when Adonai Mitchell gets drafted ahead of him, how much will that hurt? It will feel so much better when he gets drafted ahead and busts <laughs> because I will be right and the NFL uh -huh. will be wrong. Right, right. It, it is unique you guys both have him at five by the way yeah I'd, i have I'd, him at 10 i like him um five i'm not a sheep <laughs> <laughs> yeah but what yeah, if i do what, this what, are you a turtle what if i do this hey, it makes him like a, i was gonna say he moves the, up to nine of the, the it's funny having the balance of his theme song being based off a very slow, slow animal slow and yet animal, he is yeah. such a fast man uh lad he comes from a green school though Oregon. Okay. Okay. Just We're turtle color. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Lad McConkey. Oh, oh, laddie. I think we are universally, I mean, consensus wise, we're a little bit higher than most on Lad McConkey. I uh, just saw a mock draft with him projected as the receiver that the Buffalo Bills ended up with. And it would be perfection. At 28. He's six, uh, six feet tall, 186 pounds, uh, ran a 4.39. And that shows up on film. This dude is really, really fast, but he's also very quick. You know, some guys... There's a difference, yeah. They, they've he got is... a top speed. This guy just starts and stops so jitterbug style. He was the best player at the Senior Bowl, in my opinion. He, he's in and out of his breaks at a uh, Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua last year kind of level. I think he's going to be a best friend of quarterbacks if he lands in the right situation. So Jason and I have him at six. Mike, I do have him. I had moved. You have him, him at six as yeah, well. Yeah, I moved him up six because I am calling my shot on the Buffalo Bills or so the, draft him. Yeah. the The strangeness, though, if you're not familiar with Lad McConkey, is watch his highlights and you'll go, "Whoa, like this guy's on a on Georgia. Like this guy's a. I think he. Do we have two championships for? Yeah. So like he's a multi championship wide receiver on one of the best teams or the the best team of college. Look at him go. He's absolutely incredible. This guy must have been a huge part of the Georgia offense, and then you you would be sadly mistaken because he was not. You know, he <laughs> like, like even his sophomore year, fifty eight for seven hundred sixty two and seven. That's not that's his best. That's not the worst numbers in the world. But then this last year, thirty for four seventy eight and two, and it's. He uh, dealt with injuries. Yes. Only yeah, played nine games. Yeah, he didn't play them all, but it still is very bizarre because his per route analytics are amongst the top of these wide receivers, but his overall total production and his importance to Georgia was was not – it doesn't match he how has, good it seemed like he was. Yeah, he has red flags in his profile. And, and they are the production aspects because there is the argument to make if he is as good as we believe he is on film, as plenty of prognosticators believe putting him in the first round in recent mock drafts, then why did the team, why did Georgia not utilize him right. more as a primary weapon, as a we've got to get this guy involved? They really didn't. Now, can't really complain too much. They won two titles doing it I was going to say they way. also have the best players at every position. Yeah, so you know? um, there's also the concern, I've seen it said, you know, one of the things you look for, especially in wide receivers coming out of college, is their breakout age. That is a really sticky, important step. Does he step. even have one? He does not have one because he yeah. never <laughs> broke out. That is kind of not true, though. Um, and I want it said because I've seen a lot on Twitter about you don't draft guys that never broke out, and he never broke out. The The breakout is an arbitrary line. It is universally seen as 20% dominator rating in a season. He was at 19.9 in his sophomore season. So it's like, okay, you're telling me he didn't break out because of 0.1%. He he had a breakout, and that would have been a, a good age. That would have been 21 or uh, 
20, 20 year old uh, breakout. Just to break in on the breakout, the college dominator is the percentage of a team's receiving yards and touchdowns. Yep. And so if you're over that uh, 35%, you're in an incredible place, which uh, Marvin Harrison was 47%. Yeah, he's because Marv is that guy. I mean, uh, my last goodness. note for Lad McConkey is uh, when you're talking about landing situation, the guy destroyed zone. Like his zone yards per route run, four point two seven. I mean, it's outrageously high compared to his man yards per route run, which is just over two. So he, if he finds the right spot, he. Then... I just started thinking about the Rams having him. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's... and the comedy of that. Oh, of, was, the, of that trifecta. That's wild. Is when when I would watch watching him, it there was so much of it that was like Travis Kelsey esque of him just finding like yep. run running an intermediate route and then going, oh, there's nobody around me. I'll just turn around here and be a wide open target for the quarterback. And so uh, give high me, football IQ. Yes, good routes, great so, hands. He's, we'll, he's good across the board. But I will say, we'll from see. a fantasy football perspective. If he doesn't have the draft capital to kind of force him into being the lead of a team, he could be relegated to a slot role that is, um, you know, it, it, it could very easily become someone like a Christian Kirk, a Sterling Shepard. Really good players. They had great careers, but they weren't really fantasy dominators often. Yeah, they were, they were used uh, like Glad McConkey at Georgia. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> so there is a little bit of hesitation there from a ceiling outlook um, from from a fantasy perspective. Well, let's talk about uh, the, the pair of Texas wide receivers, and then we'll throw out another name or two that we like from the remaining bunch, maybe as a sleeper draft selection a la you know, the Amon Raz of years past. But let's talk about uh, Xavier Worthy out of Texas. You guys both have him ranked ahead of Adonai Mitchell, who I have ranked ahead of uh, Worthy. Um both dynamic athletes. Xavier Worthy is 165 pounds. Uh, he ran a 4-2-1. The fastest man in the history of the combine. So uh, this is a burner. He had more production at Texas than, uh, than Mitchell did. Mitchell was a transfer. Also did very little at, in the competitive Georgia environment as a freshman and a sophomore. But, you know, for me, I like Adonai Mitchell more. I think he's uh, more versatile. This was a player that ranked as the third most athletic at the combine. Ran a four three four, four three four at over two hundred pounds yeah, and six foot two, forty pounds heavier than. Yeah, if, if you looked at Franklin as disappointing at the combine, Mitchell did the opposite of that in impressing him his way maybe into the first I, round. I think he he combined his way guaranteed into the first round. I liked him as a tackle breaker. I liked him as a player that was great around the boundary, um, off target throws. He found a way to catch them. Very, very quick receiver. Uh, like you said, 6'2", 205. Um, I preferred him. I think Worthy is in that potential one-trick pony category that I'm concerned about, which you know, you're know you going to see that speed, and then you're going to be the next Darius Hayward Bay. Um, but you guys – Long both, career. That's that's true. <laughs> DHB that's was, true. In the, was in the league for he a long time. was in the league for a while, but – MVS got another big second contract. Yeah, I don't want to uh, to allow my opinion of Mitchell versus Worthy to be the only one. And you guys both, you know, would be quick to point out Worthy had the youngest breakout age in the wide receiver class. He broke out at 18 years old. Uh, tell me some of the reasons you why why you might believe that Worthy could do more than just stretch the field. Yeah, I mean it's it's ironic because. Earlier in his career, he was used down the field. And then as he got, you know, this last year, there was a lot of behind the line of scrimmage stuff. And I think that's just a matter of knowing that for Texas, Worthy was their number one wide receiver. And he has he established himself two years earlier as like a, a really special athlete. Obviously the fastest test in the history of, of the combine. He plays, you know, he's just a little tiny rocket ship. And so they wanted to get the ball in his hand have him run away from guys, uh, you know, special teams, wherever they could get him involved. It is concerning to have a guy who's only 165 pounds. That doesn't usually work. Now, we have adapted well, over the last few years. You know, Tank Dell is... A, is I was we bring, haven't, yeah. We've seen very few wide, that range, wide receivers at that weight. But that is exactly Tank Dell's weight. So. Yeah, so um, he gives a little bit of hope 
to me, the the things I liked about Xavier Worthy, I felt like he was a more complete wide receiver than Adonai Mitchell um, when I'm comparing the the teammates together. I am personally like way down on Adonai Mitchell, and it feels bad. It feels stupid because he's going to be a first-round talent. Or, or No, he's not. He's going to be a first-round draft <laughs> so, pick. No, you said the right thing. <laughs> he's going to be a first-round right thing. <laughs> I just no, remember scouting. Oh, I man. remember scouting and going like, how do people have a first-round grade what, what's on What's crazy is, 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 and I don't know what it what the discussion out of it will be. But like you and I both watched Adonai Mitchell, a lot of film on him. Yeah. We both watched a lot of Troy Franklin. We did not come away with the same opinion. Not at all. And, and some of that can be biased by what we like to see in wide receivers in general. How are you a fan of football? What do you like from your wide receiver? What kind of prototype or archetype do you believe that these players can become? And to me, it was like I, I brought up Adonai Mitchell as the Anquan Bolden, the 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 tackle breaking, falling forward, yard after the catch. He's not a yard after the catch guy. He ha he has a, uh, a a good ability to break tackles. He is a great tackle breaker. I think he has a he doesn't track the ball well. He quits on plays. Oh I, gosh! I mean, I just I didn't see it. There were there. You watched the wrong games. I mean, that is true. Which we're is not, a fair. That's a red flag for Adonai Mitchell. Is there was intensity levels in certain games that weren't in others, and so. That is a re I mean, that was an actual weakness for him is that sometimes he just didn't put in the effort. So I think it's a fair critique. I don't know where these two guys are going to go, Mike. Um, so, the you know, I think Mitchell's going to go ahead of Worthy, though. The, my big red flag for Adonai Mitchell, is what, and again, this is what are we looking for, where Andy's excited by the strength of, like his contested catch percentage, er, percentage was he caught 54% of them. That's amazing. But nearly 40% of his targets were contested, which is telling me this dude is not getting open the way that he needs to be getting open. I mean, I'm trying Talk to, about two fast receivers, 4-3-4, four, 4-2-1. Four, four, yeah, right. I'm trying to go back through my database and even going to like – so back to 2020, guys in their draft year, you know, their, their final season of college production and, and then getting drafted, there's like no one even close – to Adonai's, 39.8% of his targets were contested. Uh, speaking of the dominator ranking uh, for those guys, he was at 32%. He had 44% of Texas's touchdowns. Yeah, his dominator's insane because it's all touchdown. It's not It's not the yards. But Worthy was at 39%, so he he, had, he you know got it done as well in terms of the yardage. So that's where they alternated. It was like... You know, you kind of saw that from Brian Thomas sometimes. They just, you get around the mm -hmm. end zone and he just caught a bunch of them. Uh, you know, when looking at some other names before we get towards the end here, I mean, it's perfect to me that Michigan would have a wide receiver that is exactly like the running back in the draft, Blake Corum. Right. That is exactly like the quarterback in the draft, J.J. McCarthy, who is Roman Wilson, who, look, those are like, all three of them were, were like work pale type yeah. of players they don't have these perfectly prototypical combine numbers and yet all three of them production wise eyeball wise like roman wilson is the player to me that profiles as the next almon raw st brown type of um better than you thought he was kind of player i love roman wilson i really do i, I when when you look he, he's similar to lad mcconkey in that i'm so confident in a long, valuable career in the NFL. I'm not necessarily confident that he's going to be a superstar fantasy asset, but of that same, like, Sterling Shepard type, he is a very – his hands are great. I think he has the second-best hands in this entire draft class. He is tough as nails. He's very, very fast. And so, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can run a good route and catch a ball, you should be an NFL wide receiver. Um, I like him a lot. The, the, the other name I'll throw out there from me – is Xavier Leggett. We talked about him uh, comically on the Dynasty podcast a few times. This is a guy who found the Cave of Wonders after his <laughs> fourth year in college of being an unproductive, worthless, non-existent wide receiver, wished upon that lamp to become the uh, best wide receiver he could be and was granted that wish. And then all of a sudden in his fifth year, which is a giant red flag, as like a 23-year-old playing amongst teenagers, which is a giant red flag, was dominant. I mean, he was so powerful, so fast. His hands were good. 
His athleticism is – he might be the best athlete in this entire draft class, uh, sub 4'4 four, four at 221 pounds. He makes no sense because there's no way that the guy who did what he did in 2023 – could have been so non-existent for the four previous years, but that's that's what you get. So I tell everybody, don't draft Xavier Leggett because of all the red flags. I will be drafting him because <laughs> I'm a you love red glutton flags. for punishment here. Yeah. Jason and I pretty much had the exact same experience with Leggett of watching his most recent film and then going back and looking at the stats and going, how how is this possible to go from absolute nothingness? I think it was like 150 yards. Jim, oh, I remember that. Uh, right? I think it was 160. I think he might have got it to 160. And and then to a guy who is the opposite of Brian Thomas of of high pointing every ball perfectly. It, it his tape this year is absolutely the, incredible. This last year he was 71 for 1255 and was dominant. Here are his yards, not in a game. These are yards in the seasons prior. 80 total yards in a season, 113 total yards in a season, 63 yards in a whole season, 167 yards. He should be really happy for his most recent season. <laughs> yeah. it, Don't draft him. It's not it, going to work. It is so wild. And just a, a a deeper name that analytically is it's exciting to me. It's Jermaine Burton out of Alabama. And this guy, it's a, another explosive athlete, but it's just huge monster catch after monster catch 20 and a half yards per completion his uh his a dot so average depth of target was almost 18 yards almost what? yeah dude it, everything he got was fully downfield and he his you know like production wise uh, tie uh, touchdowns is actually a good per market share percentage and his dominator is is good as well because of the touchdowns but it's like this is an Alabama wide receiver who, I mean, he played two years also at Georgia, then went to Alabama, is this A dot huge yards per completion guy. He won't – I don't see a path where, you know, we're excited about this Jermaine Burton's turn into a superstar, but someone who should go in the middle rounds that has already proven that he can be a huge catch player. I've got my eye on him. All right, there's one tight end we'll talk about at length because he has the greatest fantasy implications and relevance, and that's how we roll. Um, did you guys talk about a lot more than one tight end on the Dynasty show? We sure did. Well, that must have been fun. Uh, Brock Bowers. <laughs> we'll talk about Brock Bowers be because, because he is a he is a weapon. He is a, a force, really. He was the best weapon at Georgia as a freshman and um, just multifaceted skill set. He's the only two-time John Mackey Award winner since the title was awarded as best tight end in the country. Um, 6'3", 243, broke out at 18 years old, 30% dominator ranking. Only 21 years old right now. So why do you want to, you know, kind of probably poo-poo on him, Jason? Because I know that's what you're known for is just kind of <laughs> squashing the potential and the hopes of young tight ends. And luckily, some tight ends like Sam Laporta, they say, you know, they double middle finger and uh -huh. throw the birds at you. And – they just say, I, you know, what you say is, is kind of stupid. But why do you think Brock Bowers is going to suck? Because I know you do. I think Brock Bowers is an exceptional talent. Um, clearly the best tight end in this draft class. Coming in the pre-NFL draft period of scouting, I would say he's probably the second best tight end that we've scouted over the last several years. I, I would personally put him behind the appearance and production of what we saw in Kyle Pitts. People could put him ahead. Brock Bowers is absolutely sensational. He will – A top 10 pick um, most likely. I can't likely. imagine him dropping past the Jets at 10. Um, I've seen plenty of mocks where he does. He goes to the Bengals. I mean, there's there's also great landing spots here that from a fantasy perspective could be really, really valuable for even his rookie year um, uh, outlook. For me, you want to talk about the poo-poo because I will. I'll, I'll <laughs> throw all over here. No, we know. Is – from a game theory perspective, drafting first-round rookie tight ends is a losing proposition. It just is. How many tight ends in the league, in fantasy, are your league winners? There's Travis Kelsey. Yeah, um, you're forgetting? Morning. There's, uh, there's. I mean, there was a year of George Kittle. Yeah. Uh, Laporta was really good last year. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was a league. Mark player. Andrews had a Laporta year. Laporta was a league. Mark player. Andrews had a yeah. year. Jimmy Graham 
had years. Right. But this is my point. Like, there's no. Not, I mean, we've done the show like nine years, and that's like you nine know, years. You named like, and like I named five fewer of our than nine. nine. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just so like, like it almost always happens, but not always. You're, you're, you know, it's like Brock Bowers is a great talent, but whether he will pay off on, you know, you, you, what you're giving up at the fifth or sixth spot in a rookie draft to take that shot on that tight end, this is going to be the one. Well, no, you're not taking that shot on it for him to be the one if you're in a dynasty rookie draft. you are. Those players work out over time. There's a different discussion because you always point out year one might be a problem for a talented tight end. I was not talking about rookie years. I was talking about total career. Actual difference-making fantasy tight end. Yeah, there's just not a bunch. There's usually two or three every Which season. Which is why they're so valuable and why I think, much like quarterbacks in a super flex, you take your shots because the value to your team is so exceptionally great. And you saw it, whether it was Gronkowski leading people to titles for multiple years or Kelsey for multiple years or Andrews for multiple years or Laporta this last year. Like, it does make such a difference to the team that I, I think it's a, a philosophical decision if that you, you can make. Knew, if you knew that Brock Bowers was going to be Kelsey. Absolutely. Abs if, if you're talking about the difference he makes to a team – you yep. can't replace it. The, yeah. It's it's humongous. That difference of having Travis Kelsey dominating year after year after year. If you had Antonio Gates dominating year after year after year. If you can get that guy, it is worth it. But my point is only in the hit rate. The hit rate of all these prospects. I mean, it doesn't every every draft season there are the best tight ends in the draft, and it's you know it's it's uh, O.J. Howard and it's Kyle Pitts and it's David Njoku who finally broke out in year seven, and it's Evan Ingram who had a great rookie year but has not been a difference maker for fantasy. It's every single year. I mean, it was like when when was the last Sam well, Laporta? Let me ask did you a different stuff. question. Let me rephrase it. Okay, which tight end from this year's draft has the best chance of Brock potentially oh. being the next Kelsey? For sure, Brock. And Bowers. that's all I'm saying. I'm saying like. You're in a dynasty league. Kelsey's going to age out, right? There are a handful of difference-making tight ends. If you want to take a shot at getting a difference maker, Brock's the guy. I would love – do not hear what I'm not saying. I would love to have Brock Bowers on my fantasy team. I would not sacrifice the opportunity of a higher hit rate at a wide receiver, a first, if you know, second-round wide Brock receiver. If you're Bowers and Brian Thomas, yeah, exactly. you can't be saying that Brian Thomas is, is you know – I think that's an equal risk, Brian Thomas is, to Brock Bowers. The reason why that hit rate is so repulsive to you is because there's very few tight ends that go in the first round ever. There's piles of first-round wide receivers that don't do stuff. Jalen Rager and, you know, the, the, the Darius Hayward Bay, like we talked about earlier, or Justin Blackman, or, you know, all these guys that get drafted, Corey Davis. Like, there are a billion failures, but there's a billion successes at wide receiver tight ends. They're very much on a, on a pedestal of observation where it's like when they fail, the world watches. And when they succeed, the world watches. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get it. I think you would take Brian Thomas Jr. over Brock Bowers. Yeah, I mean, landing without spot. Knowing landing without spot. knowing landing spot, yes. With knowing landing Mike, spot, maybe not. where are you not. at with that? Uh, I lean more on Jason's side of feeling that the percentage of that the wide receiver will hit. You have to sniff be, that farty dropped earlier mm, then. Yeah. I, I have. Drink it in. <laughs> Enjoy. It's, that's that, not the best. That, someone smell popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. It, it. I. I'm on Jason's side of the hit. Not just first round wide or first round tight ends. It's just tight ends that they. They often and don't come through, and you have to wait on them. So it's unless you don't. Right, like what? if you get a Sam Laporta, yes, of course you don't. I'm just, right, but everyone who drafted I'm Sam Laporta was the consolation prize. Yeah, he oh, was I get the it. Third round, uh, rookie I, pick. I get it. I'm just saying, like I like looking at guys on a case by case basis because there's not been that many of them over a long span of time drafted in the top ten. Yes, I think you do a disservice to it. Now, if you individually look at Brock Bowers' destination and talent, and you say, "Well, he's probably not going to do well," that's fine. Brock Bowers is his own thing, man. And as a he prospect, lands, he's incredible. If he lands in his in the right place, I'm not going to not draft him because Kyle Pitts didn't work out with Arthur Smith. That's not going to be my reasoning because it has no. They have no bearing on right. each other. Yeah, no, they don't I, affect each other in any real way. I I agree with that, but there is also the just factoring in the 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 history of everything. And if if it hits, like I mean, it's a. 
the difference that it makes if it hits and you get that one guy that does hit is like it changes it changes the whole future of your team for these for, things for are quite always a while. very interesting because there is a front end to every trend right there is the beginning of the undersized wide receiver mm -hmm. having excellent sure. production at the NFL level and then you observe it 4 years later are you saying Sam Laporta is the beginning of getting tight end I'm rookies I'm saying it's involved? possible that it is possible it's I possible that in an evolving NFL that doesn't let you touch uh the defense you know the offensive player you know Brock Bowers is is next level elite we're talking top 5 potential in the draft so um but it's just there's he, a reason we're only talking about him though he is, he's the one that jumps the, out the names so here Kyle assembled us the names I assume these are just like the highest uh rookie picked tight end so Kyle Pitts if you spent the 103 on Kyle Pitts uh, are you disappointed? Probably. So far, yeah. O.J. Howard, didn't work out. Dalton Kincaid, you're feeling okay with that. T.J. Hawkinson at the 110. I don't remember who else was there, but I'll, you're feeling I'll, good I'll, with I'll that. I'll say it's good. I'll say his, his career has worked out more than it hasn't. Njoku, this year aside, very, very disappointing. Noah Fant uh, didn't work. Evan Ingram, Michael uh, Michael Mayer, Hunter Henry, Mike Gesicki, Hayden Hurst, Pat Fryermuth, and Sam Laporta. That's a... That is a much larger list of misses. Now, there there are only six of them. No, five total that were drafted in the first round of one QB drafts, right? Is that what that says in terms uh, of rookie in, drafts? In terms of like recent memory, yeah. So that's five names as your history lesson. Yeah. And out of those five names, you were disappointed. Oh, it's very small sample. You were disappointed twice. You're kind of happy twice. So um, very small I, I lean on the side of just – View it in a vacuum, one-time situation, but um, I understand if you're on the other side of that. Let me ask you this because I think, I think when people are in their drafts, this is the decision they're going to come to. Wherever you are, where you're past the wide receivers you're in love with, and there probably isn't a running back you're in love with, <clears throat> would you rather have Brock Bowers or Caleb Williams? One quarterback? See, yeah, because of two QB, it's obviously Caleb. Brock Bowers. He's my four. It, you're saying in a fourth single overall, quarterback, right fourth overall, in a you rookie go with the pick. top three wide receivers yes. and then Brock Bowers. Yes, because I, I genuinely think all four of those guys are not going to fail. If I don't, Ladd McConkey I don't goes think, to the Bills? Don't care. No, I would still take Bowers. Yeah, I think all four of those guys are not – they don't have a chance to fail. I really do. I believe that. I think you have three Jamar Chases and then one tight end that your worst situation is he's a solid top six guy – and your best situation is maybe you get to. But that, look, I'm not saying people didn't talk about Kyle Pitts that way. So are there ways things can go wrong? Yeah, Arthur Smith. <laughs> Arthur Smith is the way everything can go wrong in the whole world. So if Pittsburgh drafts. Do they still ship like people to like different countries? Like, didn't a lot of prisoners get dropped off in Australia a long time ago? Oh, well, yeah, when the by the Brits. Just ask him. Well, who's going? Are right, you trying you to ship off? Australia? I just think Arthur Smith might. Oh. Like they I think he has the two. I think he has the funds to get like back. a long time ago. People used to get instead of being killed, they'd get banished, exiled. They did get exiled from a land, and you don't. You know, we're not talking capital punishment here. You just go get to enjoy the beaches. Yeah. Uh, Check out this. You got an island. Yeah, you you've got this really cool island you live on now. Yeah. yeah. See you later. But instead of that, he got another job. Oh, and then he brought in Cordero Patterson. <laughs> okay. Not how I wanted to put a you know exclamation point on the show, but that'll do it for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back very, very soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.